guys just kind of you know put your hand towards this and uh, heavenly father first of all we just thank you for this day we thank you for this time we thank you for your awesome son we open our prayer of and thanksgiving because you do so much for us that maybe we don't even deserve but you've loved us you have strengthened us pulled us out of the fire many times and god for that we thank you we thank you for keeping our families together for keeping our families strong many of us may be going through things where a family member is sick or but god we thank you for keeping our families healthy and bringing my aunts through and my sisters through and all that you've done heavenly father I also want to just bring your attention to the families of the young man. I know there's another young man that got shot by the police. And uh, I know that the mother and families of Mr. Ahmad is hurting the young black gentleman that was gunned down maliciously by two individuals, a, 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 a father and his son. Help his family, Lord. Give them comfort. I know it's very difficult. I could not imagine seeing a video of my child being done or anybody that I know like that, God, and just help heal the heart of not only uh, that family, but all who live in this country or who around the world have been affected and hurt or downcast. Keep people from doing anything mean or silly or foolish or outside of your will. We ask for your blessings and we also ask that justice be done, Heavenly Father. We ask for justice for this for this family and in all these situations that it seems like our people uh, have had to endure for 400 years or, or, or more. So, but we know you are our strength and we look to you, Heavenly Father. And then your son, Jesus Christ, now we pray. Amen. So, all right. So here we have it. We're going to get into it. Now, what we're going to talk about today is uh, it, it may have to be, it may have to be broken up. This may, it may have to be a, a series of two or three lessons. But what we're talking about is spiritual warfare. What is it? How to recognize us? How to recognize spiritual warfare? Am I is something I'm dealing with? Is it a personality quirk in me that I'm dealing with, or is there a malicious spirit? Is there a kingdom or a world out there that we have to be aware of? Because if you don't know, the Satan's trick is to making you think that he's not real. He make you, the way to kill somebody and get close to him is to make them think that you mean them no harm. And then when you get in there, that's when you can do all types of damage i think that's satan's number one tool so we're going to start off this uh start this right off the night in the book of ephesians as ephesians chapter 6 we're going to start in verse 12 okay <clears throat> for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places then paul goes on to tell them to put on the whole arm of God. And so he names a series of things that we wrestle with. Now this word flesh and blood, and I know in another translation, I was reading it and it said, for we wrestle not with persons with bodies. Not we, we don't wrestle, we wrestle with persons that don't have bodies. So what does that mean to you? A, a person who it's just not some force out there just randomly uh, wrestling or tussling or coming up against you. But this is a person with wants and desires and is intelligent just as intelligent as we are now, and even before i go any farther i'm gonna i want to make sure that i state that what we're talking about ten, tonight spiritual warfare is not something that you can discern or that you can see with your five senses spiritual warfare is for an individual who is saved trying to grow in the spirit and they and they can sense and kind of understand the leadings and feelings of the spiritual man and this is how you discern this is how you discern i know what's going on with uh with a spiritual influence that's around you it has to be it has to be uh sensed by the spirit and so you know some of these things if you're in here and some of these things may seem like something that you don't quite understand just know that this is uh these are things that you have to know by the spirit and so so we know now we wrestle with principalities and powers and rulers of this dark realm. And so now we're gonna now we want to understand, well, how is this how does this affect me? How can I see something like this? And so I'm gonna to turn to Luke chapter Luke chapter eleven. Read uh, seventeen and eighteen, a few more, and then Luke 
Okay, so Luke chapter 11. What do we have? And I want to pick it up at 17. Uh, okay, and so we have a situation here where Jesus was casting out some demons. And uh, the people that were watching, some of the Pharisees or religious folks said, man, you're casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And this is Jesus' response. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation. And a house divided against itself falls. For if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. So this is what I'm wanting to establish. One, a lot of people may not understand, but here you see Christ understands and knows Satan has a kingdom. Satan has a kingdom. Now, what is a kingdom? A kingdom is an organized body of believers or a country. Uh, 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 his rulership involved not just random things or spirits here and there, but his kingdom involves an organized hierarchy of individuals that we can't even see with our eyes. This is why when we go back to Ephesians, it says uh, we have principalities and rulers, okay? There are rulers or principalities similar to how we may have uh, the president and then a governor and then a mayor. A lot of people don't understand it. Even on every city that you go in, over Harrisburg, over Concord, Kannapolis, there is a ruler or principality whose assignment from, his, from, the, from the president of his kingdom to cause damage there, to rule there, to keep them under the subjection of the ultimate leader of that kingdom. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so now we want to understand the structure of Satan's kingdom. Satan does have a kingdom. Satan's kingdom is structured in various ways for where rulers and principalities and is on from the country to your state to the each city. To even some families have demonic forces and entities that may be assigned to them, you know, depending on what their purpose is. So having established that is... You know, and one thing we do have to understand is Satan, we, we've always believed through Satan is not in hell. We think Satan sits in hell on the throne and he's big and red and he has these horns. Y'all know you do. You know you do with the pitchfork. Because that's how I've always saw Satan. But that is not according to the Bible. If we look and just take from Scripture and ask God to to uh, touch us with his Holy Spirit of understanding. Because in one thing, if if... You know, these things that we're talking about even now are things that God has put on my heart to study. And these things are may not be things that you will encounter in the mainstream setting. So even if I, you know, and I'm only a human myself, if I say anything wrong or that should be challenged, then please either write it, but go back and check all these things for yourself. So here we have, so if Satan is not in hell, where is he? Where is Satan's kingdom? What do you mean principalities and powers of the air. Now we're going to turn to Daniel chapter 10. And I believe that, you know, when you begin to take the Bible as a whole, God will start giving you the picture. And I believe these things are very, very important because some people in their lives, in their lives may have problems that no matter what doctor they go to, no matter what they try to remedy it, remedy it, you can't stop. Whether there's addictions or a husband that can't stop cheating on his wife or a child that can't quite get their behavior behavior and check sometimes we fight with sometimes the 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 riddling may not the problem may be a spiritual source and we want to be able to, to pinpoint that not only that we want to be able to deliver these as christians we should be the place that they bring those people they brought in this lay people at christ's feet or the apostles feet whether it was an ailment physically or whether it was a lunatic you know they laid him at christ's feet Okay, here we go. So Daniel, and we're dealing with Satan's kingdom. Where is it? And how uh, And how do we know where to encounter it? This is Daniel, and I'm going to start in, uh, this is chapter 10, it's for those that are follow, following along. And Daniel uh, is, uh, for those, of course, that know Daniel, he's a he's our official, but he's also a mature man of God. And Daniel is on the fast. He's on a fast that some people call Daniel's fast. And he's fasting because he knows that the scriptures say that the children of Israel should come out of bondage. They went into slavery 
at the hands of Babylon. And so for 70 years, the scripture says through the prophet Jeremiah that the Israelites were going to be slaves. And so Daniel knows 70 years are up and he's looking to his God for answers. So what does that? So he prays now as Daniel was praying in and he's fasting. The Daniel fast where he didn't fast everything. He's on his third week of his fast. Third week, two one days. And finally, after since he began fasting and praying, he has an angelic visitation. And this is what the angel says to him. And verse 11, chapter 10, verse 11. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you while he was speaking the word, I stood up trembling. And I do encourage you to read the whole chapter of Daniel, of, of, of 10. It's incredible. It is an incredible chapter of how, what happened to Daniel, the people around him, physically, as this angel, this angelic being, this non-human individual was talking to him. He, he describes how the people who he, who he was with fled. Daniel himself passed out with his face to the ground. No strength, couldn't move. Ah, that's extraordinary to me that God will come and talk to that man. And the power exuberating from the man just expect, dispensed with all, all power or strength that was in Daniel. The man had to touch Daniel. Get on up, man. Let me talk to you. 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that I that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But, 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, what we call an archangel, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Okay, so this, so this, so this is what we have. Daniel's praying. The angel comes and said, you know what? I would have been here the first day you started. But I had to wrestle from wherever he was coming from. I had to wrestle with a, uh, a a prince of Persia, and you got to understand at the time the Persian Empire were, was the dominant kingdom on the earth at the time. I believe even right now, if there had to be some sort of equivalent, then it would be as our time there would be the prince of America. There's a prince of Russia, an angelic uh, individual that watches over. And even when those people, that's why it's very, very important. A lot of times we don't agree with the leadership in our country, but we have to pray. We have to pray for that, for that individual. He goes on to tell him, let me see. He came to make him understand. And he goes down, I'm going to jump down to 20. Then he said, do you not know? Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, who defeated Persia? Who became the world power after Persia? Well, he tells you right here in the word before it even happened. Greece became the world power after Persia. But there was a prince of Greece. Now look. But I will tell you what is noted in the scriptures of truth. No one upholds me against these things except Michael, your prince. So there's an angel, an angelic being who is the prince over the Hebrews or the Israelites. I'm going to start in verse 11 just real quick to bring something out. Also in the first year of the rise to me, this is the same angel talking to Daniel. Of the rise to me, I, even I stood to confirm and strengthen Darius. Darius was the first king of persia the persia would be the would be the kingdom that released the israelites from the 70 year bondage that was inflicted on them by babylon and so that's why it's important to pray because then if even though medial persia was not god's kingdom he needed darius to be strengthened and god sent his angel and so we had to pray for the strength it releases our prayer, spiritual warfare, releases things in the atmosphere that we live in so that God can operate and bring his will to pass. We pray, God, your will be done. And by, by strengthening Darius, the 70-year prophecy could be fulfilled. 
could be fulfilled. Now, I think that's extraordinary. But at the same time, what is the situation? Where are these angels coming from? And I apologize if I'm moving too fast, you know, and if I am, please tell me to slow down. Uh, I know there's a lot of information, uh, but these angels, where are they coming from? Now, if you'll, if you'll remember, and uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and you have Paul, and Paul is 11, he's dealing with, you know, the thorn, you know, dealing with the thorn in his flesh and everything, and in 12, and then Paul said, I wouldn't be, but I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven. And he heard things that were inexplicable, inexplicable to, to hear. The man shouldn't hear. He was caught up to the third heaven. So if there's a third heaven, to me, in my logic, it makes sense to me to understand that there must be a second and a first heaven. You know, uh, it's, it's like Christ's name was lifted up above all the heavens which would imply there's more than two. You can say both the heavens. And so the place where there's a heaven that we can see uh, as far as people on earth, then there's a second heaven where evidently uh, the encounters, these warfares are encountered and from the angels that come from the third heaven. Okay? And so we're getting an understanding. That's why sometimes when you pray, you may be praying and um, uh, it feels like your your prayer is just hitting the ceiling, you, and, and you but you stay there. That's why some people call it praying through. But then all of a sudden you seem to make a breakthrough. Then all of a sudden God's spirit lifts you up, and you've made some sort of breakthrough because there is indeed a, a, a level that must be gotten through. There is oppositions through your prayer. And when, those, when these answers are coming, there's opposition, and then there's angels coming on your behalf. So when you get down to pray, and when you feel dry, and when you feel dejected, do, don't give up. Keep on doing it day after day. You keep proclaiming God's goodness. Keep proclaiming God's word, because there are whole realms moving on your behalf. Amen? Okay, so now to even take it even deeper. Uh, so we went through praying through. Now I want to... Uh, to, to just go one more thing, one more step as far as as far as the uh, the angels, were the demonic angels or angelic beings that influence what we do on the earth in them, and I'm trying to start from the top down and bring it down to how these things affect us individually. So, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 28, and <clears throat> see, we're going to try to read a good bit of this. Ezekiel is a wonderful prophet. I love Ezekiel a lot. As I see my son's names. Um, just a man that was so given to God. To be a prophet of God, God will give these individuals uh, assignments. And they would, a prophet of God, you have to be instant obedience. Uh, God told Ezekiel to walk butt naked for some time. And to hear the man of God, he's walking around butt naked. God wouldn't let Ezekiel talk only at certain times. He was mute. The only time he could talk is when the spirit of the Lord was on him. He was prophesying. It's powerful. And on and on and on and on again, you know, but so here we go. Ezekiel and he's, and he's prophesying. He's giving out a prophecy, which seems to be to uh, a man or a king, but then it goes a little bit deeper. And so let's, 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 let's listen in. The word of God, this is Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. He's going to talk to a prince. He's going to talk to a king. If you're not paying attention, you will think he's talking to the same individual. But these are two different people. The first one is a man. The first, the second one is a spirit. Okay. Chapter two, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man. So the seas talking to a man and you ain't God, boy. Though you set your heart as the heart of God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself, okay, and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, 
You have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you have set your heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into, a, into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am God? But you shall be a man and not God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hands of the aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord. Now here comes the switch. Moreover, the Lord said to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. The first one was the prince of Tyre. Now this is the king of Tyre. And say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, this prince was not in Eden. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, the turquoise, and the emerald with gold. Your workman, the workmanship of your workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared in you the day you were created. Does anybody know who he's talking about? The king, the over the, the person over the man, the spirit over the man. He's talking now, Satan himself. Satan himself, uh, whose timbrels were prepared in him on the day he was created. He had power over music. That's why we got to be careful. We'll be just throwing our old, our old iPod or whatever we do, because there's a lot of spiritual influence. The evil one himself has a lot of power over these types of ways. 14 says, you were the anointed cherub that covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So of course, this is not a man, but you were the anointed cherub that covers. What is he saying? Satan, you were the Christ. Anointed means Christ. You were the Christ cherub that covered. I don't know if you know, you could, if, if you remember the tabernacle with Moses and he told Moses to have, um, I forgot the guy's name at this point, but he told him to put two angels over at each side of the mercy seat. So, uh, so the, the covering, they covered God's presence. You were the Christ cherub, the covered presence of God. And he's in, in the beginning, this is a lamentation for the King of time. So the spirit of God is lamenting. Lament means I'm hurt. I'm crying. He loved him. Okay, you were perfected in your ways. To, and you were perfect, perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub. From, uh, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore, I brought fire from your midst. I devoured you and I turned you into ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew among the peoples are astonished. You have become a horror and shall be no more. So this is a prophecy that's still in effect. And one thing that I want to bring out concerning this prophecy is, as you notice in both of these things, your heart was lifted up. It was pride. It was pride. It was pride. One of the one of the greatest, or if not the number one worst sin that we can have. As church goals and believers, lovers of God is pride. Pride is the destroyer of relationships, marital relationships, free relationships, church families. You were lifted up. You thought you deserved more. You were not humble. You look at the difference between Christ and Satan himself. Christ humbled himself and it was given him a kingdom. Uh, honor and majesty was given to Christ and he bought and he was bought up. But Satan was proud. Feel like he deserved it and it was trying to take it and you see the end of satan for those that are lifted up in pride therefore so 
on this earth, the religion that most attracts men, whether it's hidden inside Christianity or church assembly, is the is the falsehood of pride. And now and and so I'm going to turn to um, uh, Samuel, First Samuel, Let's see. because this is very this is very very important when you allow yourself to be open to pride. You open yourself up to demonic influence. You open yourself up to demonic influence, and and and, and which leads to all sort of not just wrong ideas or wrong decision making, but to demonic decision making, demonic ideas. You open the door. And we got to keep that in mind. Pride. So we always must pray. God keep us humble, small in our eyes. None of us deserve anything that God has given us. If I, if you know anything that's intellectual or sounds intelligent, even your voice, God give it to you. Thank God for that. But he can take it away. And we just must always give our praise and glory and honor to our beautiful God. And so, all right. So first Samuel, and uh, let's see what time is it? I want to go over too long. So like I said, something like, we're going to have to take this up. So, so it hasn't been too long just yet. So now we know how Satan's kingdom seems to be set up in this spiritual warfare. We know kind of how his hierarchy is. We understand that now you have angel, you have demonic angels that may be over a geographic location. I don't care where you go. Look at think of the cities that surround where you live. And you know, there's characteristics to them all. You can go to Gastonia, there's a different feel there, and there's a different main problem there. And it feels different than when you go to Kannapolis. Charlotte, Paul says Charlotte feels different than when you go to Harrisburg. Okay, you know, whereas in Harrisburg, the problem might be, okay, there's more money. There might be, the problem might be a pride situation, where in another part, there may be a drug type of situation. There's demons that rule Africa that will keep Christianity or the word of God from coming to that area. And so that's established. And we know that the different places, different parts have different assignments. And I think different ethnic groups sometimes have different uh, demonic forces that they deal with. Different mentalities is very difficult for them to snap out of. And, you know, I think, I think the, the demon over the American Indian is, has been a savage. You know, you can look at the, the American Indian in itself, and I think there is a, a demonic force that's, that's targeting them. But as you see, one thing about the American Indian, a lot of, a lot of what they believe is steeped in witchcraft. And and uh, and some of those things. So that's what we're going to get into now. The uh, the natural the way for a lot of these demons to get in uh, to our thinking and our way of life is through what we believe, because everybody has a a particular belief that uh, they believe in some religion, because from whatever culture that they come from, and uh, and I believe that the the religion that many people use is. And, if, and the religion of fallen man is witchcraft. It is the go-to. It is the go-to of fallen man. And I believe you, if you look at every single culture on the earth, and, you, and you, if you can think of their, that still has a hint of their primitive culture, then there's a witch doctor or a shaman or somebody. You look in Africa, all these, all of them have a root doctor or a witch doctor. You look at voodoo, a witch doctor. You look at the American Indian, they have a witch doctor or a shaman or somebody. You know, did you give them, cut up a root and make a and and make some sort of offering to some deity? Where did this come from? These things have been passed passed down, passed down through generation to generation, because man's the natural religion of fallen man is witchcraft. Okay, so. Let's see, 1 Samuel 15. Samuel 15 started in, starting in 22. And, like, and, and one thing that we're trying to do right now, even for those that are looking now, or those that may look at this at a later date, you need deliverance from something maybe. You need to be broken through from something. You need that pressure off of you. You need to be able to move move in the way that God wants you to move, but you're restricted. And so we're looking for, we're trying to show and and bring deliverance to those that are captive 
by Satan's devices. So 15, this is Saul. Saul has uh, um, has been disobedient in regards to what he was supposed to be doing with God. So Samuel had to give him the old word. 15, I'm going to start in verse 22. And Samuel says to Saul, <clears throat> So Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, uh, and to heed the fat and to heed then the fat of rams. For rebellion, okay, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity is is iniquity and idolatry because he rejected god the word of god uh the word of the lord he has also rejected you so here we have we have a tie-in hello lord we have a tie-in where uh rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft now we all know rebellion came as a result of satan's pride when satan's pride comes up and that's and and this is the order rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft now, we all know that later in Saul's life, I think it goes on to, when you get to the 28th chapter of 1 Samuel, what is Saul doing? Saul is sitting at a witch's table trying to get some insight. Saul himself had gotten rid of all of the witches in the land. But now he's, when he rebelled, when he was filled with pride, then he rebelled. Now he's himself in witchcraft. And also, too, stubbornness. Stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. Um, stubbornness, as far as idolatry, when you are stubborn, and some people, I've heard people, they, they gloat in the fact that they are a stubborn individual. Well, you know I'm stubborn. Not realizing that you are under some sort of, you may be under a demonic influence. Stubbornness is idolatry. Why? Because you idolize your own thoughts and your own opinions. You put those before anything. You know, and, I, and that idolatry of how you see yourself has, a uh, has blinded you from understanding uh, the truth from God's light. So, all right. So now, so we now we see the, this whole witchcraft aspect. Now I'm just going to uh, go over a couple of scriptures briefly. Of a lot of people don't understand how prevalent witchcraft is in the Bible, and not only that, the days that we're living in are full of witchcraft. Most people, you know, because uh, God has led my heart to study, study deeper. To do a deeper study on the people who make our movies, who run our news channels, who run our banks. And they are secret. See, they are steeped in secretly in witchcraft. And it sounds like a some sort of far-fetched movie, but it's not, and it's indeed true. And I'm you know, and you can look up these verses if you want to on your own, but I'm gonna start. Okay, you have Moses when he's in Egypt. Who was his enemy there besides Pharaoh? When he threw the snake down, and uh, who duplicated that? Okay. When he uh, brought turned the water into blood, who duplicated that? Janice and Jambres, the magicians, the magicians of Egypt. And, and, I, and, I, and I forgot to mention that witchcraft goes under various names in the Bible. It might be witchcraft, it might be sorcery, or it might be divination. You know, and I've even said to a friend of mine before, you know, somebody, some woman might say, hey, I'm a diva. Not realizing that this word comes as a short version of divination. You're a God. You're a female God. Not even, you know, the weird. And so when we do things like that, we do things like that unknowingly many times. Hey, cuzzo. Unknowingly many times we'll open ourselves up to demonic influence. And so. <clears throat> so now, so now we see, so we see even from the beginning of the book, the witch sorcerers, magicians, challenging, uh, challenging Moses as he's in Egypt. And then when the church is finally born and Christ and Christ is received up and he's sending his apostles and disciples out, the first evangelist goes out, Philip, and I think it's in the eighth chapter and I did not write it down. But it's in the eighth chapter, Philip goes down to Samaria. He's preaching. They believe. And who does he encounter? The first thing the church encounters was a sorcerer. A sorcerer that comes to him and says, hey, let me get, give me that skill that you have of, of, of giving people the Holy Spirit. 
And of course, Peter said it, it, it does not work like this, but you see already in every city, it said given out that he was some great one. When you look at, he goes farther, Paul and Barnabas are, are spreading the word and they encounter a slave girl who was possessed with a spirit of divination. She was a little witch, okay? Following them around, even though she was speaking the truth, but it was a spirit in her. And Paul had to rebuke that spirit out of her. Okay. And you see another situation where Paul is speaking to another official of a great city and some fellow named Elemis. His name is translated to sorcerer. Elemis the sorcerer. And so witchcraft is very prevalent. And not only is it very prevalent in the Bible, and so if we see that witchcraft, and these are remnants of our primitive culture, our primitive, where we come from, and then they get mixed in with popular society to the point, then you have uh, harmless games that seem to be harmless, but they're not, of Ouija board, people mess with Ouija boards, not realizing that they're opening, them, opening themselves up to spiritual influence. And then you, and then you have terrible card reading, and then we go online and every time we turn around, if you're a Capricorn or Pisces or this is or that, you know, these are these are methods of divination, witchcraft and conjuring, Con never realizing it. We bring all these different cultures that they seem innocent. I don't care. Even if it's then you're burning sage to ward off other spirits. You no sage to ward off no other spirit. Christ, the spirit of Christ defeats all these this nonsense. And so what happens? Your whether it's your parent, your uh, that is passed it down. If, if you've opened yourself up to palm reading, tarot cards, if you've opened yourself up to get your, to, to, to astrology, to you've opened yourself up to the occult. And this is what we're looking at. A lot of our TV shows deal with this. People don't realize that when you open yourself up to, to the occult, when you become on one mind, one plane with some of these beliefs, then they thing you know, You've opened the door for a spiritual demonic influence. And now you have a situation in, in your life that you may not can't maintain a relationship, that you have different habitual things, that your mind will not stay steady. Because, and, and it's not, you know, and you try, and it may not be willpower, but it may be. You need spiritual warfare. You need to pinpoint the situation to which you are dealing with. And I'll tell a quick, a quick story. I I, I have um I know someone that whose uh, whose child was uh, seemed to have mental mental be, mental mental issues, and you know this this person was a mother had a, a daughter. Well, the mother began to cut herself. I mean, to the point where she had to get stitches all on her arms, all on her arms. She was solid and she drove herself to solitude by herself and couldn't handle the prayer, couldn't go outside. I mean, I'm talking about the day before, nice, sweet, and awesome young lady. But then one day you wake up in the morning, who is this person? This person is, and so I know the mother of it, the, the mother of the mother that was cutting himself called me for my thoughts. I told them that you, you know, uh, you, you had to come up and try to help this person out. And, but when she saw the situation, she was very hurt. She said, I can't see my, my child going through this. It's just too much. She's cutting herself. I'm going to leave her. I'm going to go back. And I said, well, you can't do that because, you know, you have your grandchild to think about. You can't leave her up there in that situation. Just stay here. Ask God to give you strength. And we'll, we'll, I'll go to God in prayer and see what happens. That night, I had been praying. I, the good Lord woke me up extra early that morning. And as I was praying, crying over the situation, um, there was a scripture brought to my mind. The scripture was, when Jesus encountered the, the demoniac at the Gadarenes. And the demoniac ran after Jesus butt naked and he would, he would be driven away by a spirit and he would cut himself and he couldn't go around anybody, he would break chains. And of course, you know, Christ cast out these demons into a herd of pigs, 2000 of them. And they crashed off the side of a cliff. And, uh, but anyway, as I was praying, I thought the little Lord said, Legion. What's going on here is a is a is a powerful spirit that the that the people refuse to acknowledge. They're going to keep buying pills. They're going to keep going to the doctor. They're going to keep, but they're not. The root of the cause is not being dealt with. And so it was my job. I had to say to this person who doesn't understand spiritual warfare, who will probably think I was a little bit cuckoo, 
and say, your problem is a legion of spirits. You have no power over this. You have to ask God. No one's going to help you except, except God by his son, Christ, and by his spirit. And if you, don't, if you don't admit that, there'll be no help. You know what? She complied and we touched and agreed and we prayed. Oh, and before this, well, the, the, the young lady had told me that her daughter had said, I can't, I, I don't want to talk to you. You might as well go back to wherever you came from. You're not going to see me. You're not going to see my child. Took her off of the visitation list because at this time, the young lady was in a, uh, you know, a, a psych ward, took her and took her off of the list. And so she told me all of this. And I told her, I thought the guy that told me, we prayed for the situation and then we hung up and I was at work. 15 minutes later, my phone rang, and when I answered, it was the same person, and she and she and she said, "You would never believe what just happened." As soon as me we hung up after praying, this person called me in their right mind because we had rebuked the spirit from 50 miles away. He called me back in their right mind, put me back on the list, and gave me all the authority to do what I had to do to get things done. Okay, and that's just one story: spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is real. And I, and sometimes sometimes you have to ask yourself, you know, in my life, is this something I'm dealing with? Is there a, is there a spirit in my house? Is there a spirit in my spiritual house? And what do I have to do to get this spirit uh, um, out of here? We know these there is sorcery out there. If, if I, I could myself do a teaching on David Duke, uh, David Duke Coveney and Jody Foster and all these people in Hollywood, who absolutely believe in spirits and magic and witches and warlocks. Why do you think that why do you think that everything your children in their minds conditioning to accept the occult, to accept every part of wand? Look, Hollywood itself, Hollywood is the wood that's used to make a wand. You cannot make a wand unless it's made out of Hollywood. Coincidence, maybe. But I don't think it's coincidence when you be also begin to consider the amount of the occult that's mixed in, that's mixed in with the messages that these people put out. They believe strongly. They have covens. They're masters of the second and third veil. And they put a spell on the people who watch this so that they will not realize that they are putting incant incant incantations. And enchantments, and you have to understand that these witchcrafts they work, they work, and they work with curses and such. I don't know if you remember Balaam, and I think I might have brought him up before, but Balaam was his assignment by Balak, the king, was to curse, was to curse the children of Israel so that they could attack them in battle because they came out of Egypt. Because back in the back in those days, it was a it was it was the custom. It was the custom to have a man, a, a shaman, or a, a witch doctor, and this is kind of what Bethlehem was, was to put a curse on the people before war. First, you had to engage with them in a spiritual warfare before you can get engaged with them in a physical warfare. These practices moved and held civilizations up. These people, the most intellectual the most intellectual arms of these civilizations believed this stuff and they passed it down. And my God, you best believe that to this day in this country, even right now, there are people that believe in pentagrams. Like e even right now in our state's capital, across the street from the con congressional building, bigger than the congressional building, is a huge building. You know what it is? It's the main building for the Masons. It has a huge statue of a guy called Albert Pike, the 33rd degree Mason. He was wrote a book, Morals and Dogmas. And he's the most, he's the most, uh, the highest Mason. You will, you, you may not recognize uh, names like Manly P. Hall or Madame Blavatsky or, you know, uh, or, uh, Albert Pike and Alistair Crowley. All these individuals that influenced the pop culture, they even influenced us, and that is strongly influencing our children. Alistair, Alistair Crawley and um, I forgot that Anna Corner of Summer Songs, from Lady Gaga to uh, to um, Jay Z and Beyonce, and they have they have symbols on their clothes that represent the Baphomet, which is the goat head, the gold of Mendez. 
but most people look and sing these musics never knowing that I'm singing the songs and the verses to the occult, to demonic activity that these people pray to. Look up, uh, look up a spirit cooking and you see all your favorite artists, all these people uh, there. And this is what, and this is spiritual warfare. This is what we have to know. We, we've let our country get to the point that now we, we can't call this out. I mean, the spiritual warfare was a very common thing in Christ's day. When Christ preached, when Christ was walking around, I mean, 30, 40% of his ministry dealt with uh, driving out demons. When Christ approached a situation, there may be a person that dumb and deaf. Because of his spiritual discernment, he can say, no, that's a physical, it's a physical ailment. He'd put his hands on the ears and say, be open, epitha. But sometimes he would approach that situation and be like, you got a dumb and deaf spirit in you, boy. Come out that young man or woman, and it will come out. But it's about being spiritually strong in ourselves. It's about understanding the spiritual world around us. Even right now, there is a demonic and spiritual attack against these message, this message that I'm trying to present tonight. If we don't understand spiritual warfare, our churches will not be able to stand because I think it, it's, I, it just popped into my mind from, I think it's a, it's first Timothy chapter three, when it's talking about perilous times and it said, these are the type that creep into, you know, there'll be, you know, disobedient to parents and it goes through that. And these are the type that creep into silly women's houses. But then it says, as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses. So these people are going to withstand us. Janice and Jambres were the magicians, the sorcerers that withstood Moses. And so I think in the last days, the spiritual power is going to be increased in the occult. They're going to have, they're going to be pronouncing curses and incantations against the church, against you and I. And if we don't have an equal, a more powerful spiritual, uh, a more powerful spiritual understanding that we can impart, then we won't have a chance. They're going to, they, they want to keep you, they want to keep you in the dark. And this is another reason why every time you turn on the TV now, there's, there's, they, they, they culture, they indoctrinate your children with these occultic movies. It seems, you know, I just watched a movie the other day. It was called Onward, trying to watch it with my son. The whole thing, Disney's movies, was about magic, spells, and can't take the whole thing it was based upon. And now every time you turn around, especially Disney, they push this stuff on us. They push this stuff and they indoctrinate these young people to when these young people get grown or when they get bigger, they really, they, they believe more of the myth than they do of the real. But let me tell you, this stuff, is real. These incantations are real, you know, and like I said, I know I'm going to continue this. I'm going to go, we're going to, we're going to go through and see how, how we can get deliverance, how these spiritual and occultic practices affect us individually until we get to the spirit of Antichrist, because that's what it all boils down to. The spirit of Antichrist when we, uh, as we draw close to the end of some of these teachings and what the spirit of Antichrist is doing and how it infiltrates, how it deceives and it takes away from the person to where they can no longer have logic. And this stuff is deep. And if you don't understand it, and if you don't have an understanding of how are we to combat the spiritual warfare, then we'll lose. And, you know, and some of the things that is going to take us, it's going to take walking seriously with our God. It's going to take being separate. If we fall, of course, let's get back up. Let's repent. But we have to have a total sense that God is with us every day, uh, no longer liberated from our God, not knowing if we're saved or not. But we need to live in the aura of his presence in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. You know, these relationships that we have ups and downs with our spouses, Put that pride down and start loving one another. You can win the argument. I don't care. Dude. I just want to love you. I just want to love you. That's all. Let's start doing more for other individuals. Let's bring back the unity of one another and forgive and love and come together and whatever I can do. And that is exactly right, Sister Lori. Cunning and deceiving. Satan's M.O. is deception. Deception. And he'll deceive through your he'll deceive through your church, he'll deceive through a movie. Christians, let's let's begin to be more prayerful and cautious of what we watch on TV. You know, sometimes, even sometimes, I might be on Facebook a little bit. And I'm, let me put this down. I got work to do. 
and then I'm still on it 45 minutes later. That's spiritual. We got to be careful. You know, that's a spirit that grips you and won't let you put that nonsense down. Then next thing you know, it's influencing your mind. Next thing you know, you can't have pray. Next thing you know, you're out there doing something you ain't got to do. You ain't got no business doing, you know? But I do. I believe so much that the that the church in these last days, we're not going to start just playing church no more, watching Sunday's best and getting entertained, but we're going to be proactive. That God will pour out his spirit in a strong way and in a strong manner to raise folk up, to bring them families back, back together. You've managed your sister or your brother. Forget all that. Just squash that. I love you. And then we're going to walk out in this world in power. Walk out in this world in power. And even in the midst of everything that's going on, uh, you know, uh, not to be on any racial front, black folks, it's going to be all right. It is going to be all right. But everything's going on and they killing folks left and right. They still ain't even came and denounced a lot of this stuff. We trust God. We know it's going to be all right. Yes, we forgive, but we are also conscious of what's going on. God's spirit is going to move on our behalf. We won't be in Egypt. We won't be in Babylon forever. God is going to bring us out of this. He's going to bring us out with much riches. And I'm talking about spiritual riches. Amen. And so I want to bring it to a close. So that's the first one. Next week, we're going to talk about um, the occult and how we can get some deliverance. That's right. You're right. Because we become desensitized to it. And, 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 and yesterday, my heart was absolutely hurt. And I was talking to my pastor about, you know, uh, and I was talking to my pastor about, you know, uh, there was a there was a situation where we're talking about 400 years of Egypt. You know, and the the word Mizraim in the Bible it means that it is translated Egypt, but the meaning of the word is bondage. So when it says you'll be in Mizraim for 400 years, that's just bondage. You're going to be carried back to Mizraim in ships. Well, we know you don't have to go in a ship to get from Israel to Egypt. But to get from that continent to over here to America, you do have to be taken in ships, you know. And uh, and so we have to realize if when God brings his people out, maybe he's talking about he's going to bring his people out in a spiritual way. But when God brings his people out, there are judgments that will take place and the people will continue to harden their hearts. And he will, and, who, and from this Corona stuff and, and from these hornets, these things coming on America, and now they're saying on the weekend, it's going to be below freezing right here in June. We discern what's going on with the weather, but can we discern the times? What is going on? What is going on? God? And, and, you know, if we could begin to, to separate sometime and then God would talk to us, that God would make clear to us. Because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, this whole spirit is taking over this, this world. Uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, as it becomes stronger, we we may be taken away because it, Christ himself said, the deceit, deception is coming will fool the elect if that was possible. I don't care if Peter and Paul and was here, and our last days are going to be rough. And so what, what does that say about us? We got to stay at his feet. We have to stay in his word. We have to be, you know, uh, act, keep our joy in him. If you're feeling down, if you're feeling dry, then go to him and, and tell him, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling down. I'm, I'm being lazy. He will pick you back up. His, 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 he will sustain you through all things. Give you a continuous energy and a love and a joy and a peace that we can shine like lights and shine like beacons. Hey, Miss Whitfield. But, hey, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I love y'all. I love y'all. I love my God, I love his Christ. And I know even in my heart, I have, if you got anything against anybody, if you ain't talking to somebody, call that person. Call that person. Tell me sorry because spiritual warfare begins with forgiveness and breaking these bonds of negativity. You know, and if, you know, some, if you took the biggest piece and you know it, somebody go ahead and give them that piece back. Wow, see? And and, 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 and and his glory was shown by the Holy Spirit. But we're going to be stronger. We're going to uh, get to where God has ordained us to be. So I love you guys. I'm going to quickly pray out. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this time help us, helping us to understand spiritual warfare. We ask you to continue us in this. We ask you to be with us during this week. We ask you to be in the midst of our decision making. You know, when 
should we get involved in things online or not? If we are to be separate in certain points, give us strength, God, because we can't do it in our own. We need to be led by your spirit, but we need, also need the power of your spirit. God, my heart is just overjoyed to you right now because I do love you. I do love you. I thank you for all you've done for me. And I want to pray right now for each of these people right now. And 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 I want you guys to repeat after me. If there, if you feel like there may be, if you've dealt with the occult right now, I denounce any occult practice, any unclean spirit. If I've touched any unclean thing, God forgive me. No spirit will influence my life. No spirit of depression. No spirit of lust. No spirit of confusion. No spirit of anxiety. You must go in Jesus name right now. Open up my mind to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so amen. And another thing, if anybody needs personal prayer, if you feel like, hey, you know, you, you want to talk more about some sort of spiritual influence that might be in your life, you want to be prayed for, you can call the, the church, you can call Pastor uh, Robin Hampton or myself, or whenever they open these churches back up, you're more than welcome to come to Abundant Living and, and, it, and we'll lay hands on you. Whatever situation, God got you. And so I love you. And in Jesus name, I love you too, cuz. All right, bye.